Hello, sweet spirits. It's Professor Stewart here today talking about um, Ernest Hemingway and Hills Like White Elephants. So let's jump right into it. Um, Hemingway is one of the, I would say, three big uh, dead white guys in the early 20th century. You've got John Steinbeck, who wrote, you probably read Of Mice and Men and um, Grapes of Wrath. Uh, he's a big one. There was William Faulkner, okay, out of Mississippi. Uh, another big modernist writer, and then Ernest Hemingway. Okay, those three guys loom large over most of the 20th century, um, and uh, you know all of them won the Pulitzer and the and the Nobel Prize and all that. So so they're all very 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 um, um, uh, famous and important writers. But they also have their blind spots, and Hemingway is one of those guys that has a lot of uh, what do we say problematic. Uh, things going on with him uh, personally and also in how he wrote that you could mine for things to write about, okay? So, briefly about Hemingway, okay? Hemingway's one of those guys who's probably just as famous, if not more so, for who he was than what he did. I mean, than what he wrote, let's put it that way, okay? Because uh, Hemingway was one of those guys. He was larger than life. He um, was just, uh, 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 just lived life to the fullest, um, he was born in a suburb of Chicago, um, Oak Park, Illinois, which is nowhere. Okay, I lived in Chicago for for about three years, and let me tell you, out in the suburbs, I mean, you see Edward Scissorhands. Okay, but that's pretty much what it was. Um, but imagine the turn of the century, not much better. You're even further from the city. So he, he was born in a, in a suburb of Chicago, but he spent the rest of his life trying to pretend that he wasn't a suburban kid from Chicago. Okay. Um, uh, just a regular old middle class uh, person. Um, when World War Two, sorry, World War One came around, uh, he was just a little. He was born in 1899, so he would have been 13 or 14, um, right when the war broke out. Um, but his father would not sign the papers, so he could go join the war, the Great War. So uh, he was bound and determined to go serve. So he enlisted in the ambulance corps um, in Spain during the Spanish Civil War, and. Um, was wounded uh, pretty badly, uh, got uh, saved a couple of Marines by dragging them to safety. So check and check uh, for your he-men. Uh, he, he was now a bona fide war hero, so he loved that. He was decorated. Um, it was a dream come true for him, okay? And he spent the rest of his life playing like that. The, some, people, some people said he had a death wish, that he was always trying to trying to, uh, to, to cheat death. Um uh, he had homes in Key West. If you ever get a chance to go down there, check it out. Uh, it's pretty cool. Worth the $5 tour. Uh, you get to see the cats with the six toes, six fingers. Um, pretty cool. They're not the same ones he had, but they're descendants. Um, it's the only house on the whole key with a basement. Uh, that's where he used to keep his liquor, and he had a lot of it. Um, he also had a place in Ketchum, Idaho. He was a big hunter. Uh, Havana, Cuba, uh, and Madrid, Spain. Okay, and he was like I said, a he-man um, into manly things such as uh, bullfighting, cockfighting, safaris. Uh, but I'm talking like not like we're gonna take pictures, but go out and and you know wrestle them to the ground kind of safaris. In fact, here's a fun fact: he survived not one but two separate plane crashes on the same safari. He walked away from one of them and crawled away from the other one, and it kind of like messed him up the rest of his life. But dang, okay, so so Ernie was the real deal, okay. Um, like I said, deep sea fishing. In fact, during he had a he had a boat called the Pilar, and during World War II, he uh, he cruised um, the uh, the uh, Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean uh, looking for submarines uh, because he you know he had to insert himself in anything that had to do with war or whatever. Um, <clears throat> any kind of blood sport he was into. And drinking heavily. He was a notorious drunk. Um, and, uh, well, he was a high-functioning alcoholic, put it that way. He, he was a heavy drinker, as most writers were during the time. It's not what killed him, but uh, it didn't help, okay? Um, and also, he was a notorious womanizer. He, uh, he was married, I believe, three, maybe, I think four times. And every time, um, like... The, the the woman he left his wife for was either his secretary or his 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 assistant. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's Hemingway. Okay, so so he is what's called a problematic writer because of his penchant for um, being a male chauvinist 
and being this sort of you know he man woman hater. Even though I, I mean that's not like Alfalfa and and in, in, in our gang, but he didn't hate women. He loved women. Um, but he certainly did have uh, this this uh, he, he he was a walking embodiment of white privilege. Okay. Um, and absolutely lost on him. Okay, uh, he he just he would not even know what that word meant. But looking back at what he was, absolutely, he was just a big white uh, white privilege. Um, he's known primarily as a novelist, uh, for whom the bell tolls, uh, farewell to arms, to have and have not. Um, uh, but Hills Like White Elephants is probably his most famous short story. But he did write a bunch of them. Um, like I said, he won the Pulitzer and he won the Nobel Prize. Um, in, I believe, 1960 for uh, The Old Man and the Sea, which is a novella. Uh, not his best, but he was old by then, and they figured they owed him one, so, so he got it. Um, <clears throat> the thing when you read this story that you will notice right off the bat is the style. Okay, he is, it, Hemingway is known, he's a, he's a stylist. Um, uh, it's sparse, it's economical, not a whole lot of description. Uh, he... he um, um, it's born of his experience as a uh, journalist during the wars. He was a cor war correspondent, and it was a just the facts kind of thing. And so um, he was of the uh, of the school of don't tell me about it, show me. So all the action takes place in dialogue, as opposed to him, exp you know, describing all kinds of things. So, and another fun fact: he wrote dialogue with one finger on a typewriter, manual typewriter, because he thought that that's how people talked. So, hey, it, so, so uh, laziness. Um, and so whatever that was about the thing with the typewriter, whatever that, um, oh, it also, he, he did most of his writing standing up, uh, because of the shrapnel is led for the war and the two safaris. So, um, all those things together, put him in a shaker, shake him up and you got Hemingway style. Okay. Um, but, um, uh, it, it's important though, because it, it is so distinctive. It's kind of hard to read sometimes. This story is a textbook example, literally, textbook example of his style. Um, uh, but the problem is with, with the dialogue is that it's very subtle. Uh, you have to you have to really read between the lines here, and especially in this story, for obvious reasons. Um, uh, just finish up Hemingway. Hemingway uh, his family, like he had, a, I think his father committed suicide, two uncles committed suicide, a couple of his granddaughters committed suicide years after he did. Um, uh, it, it's what we would probably call, um, it, it was either bipolar, maybe even schizophrenia, but, um, uh, it, it, no one knew what that was back then. And, um, and two, the drinking probably didn't help. Okay. So it was a depressant. So in his old age, he became paranoid and delusional. Um, and they, they gave him, uh, electroconvulsive treatment, which the ECT or the, uh, electric shock treatment, um, uh, to treat his um, his mood swings and and his delusions, um, but but the problem with that is if you're doing any research on what electroconvulsive therapy does, is it takes your short term memory out. So what does a writer have except for his memory? Okay, and so he couldn't write anymore, and so in his mind life wasn't worth living. So um, they had to really keep an eye on him a couple times. He almost walked. He, he intentionally almost walked into to a propeller. Um, of a plane, uh, you know, they caught him a couple times with some pills, um, and then sure enough, uh, one early one morning in 1961, he made his way down to the foyer of his home in Ketchum, Idaho, put a barrel of a 410 shotgun in his mouth and blew his brains out. So um, uh, he he uh, he's when you think of 20th century sort of male writers, Hemingway has all of the of the things, you know, troubled drinking tragic death, all of those things uh, conspired to make him almost more famous than his stories are. But um, he did have the goods, okay? Um, Hills Like White Elephants is one of those things. And um, actually, before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about abortion. <laughs> because it is it is the, uh, the, 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 um, the, it is the thing they're talking about here in the story, even though they never actually mention it for obvious reasons. It's 1927. They're not going to be able to talk about it um, uh, freely. So one of the two things that I don't allow my students to write about in a comp one classes um, are one is childhood obesity, because I just can't read that story. I can't read that paper again. It's just uh, video games. And, uh, it's just uh, it's my eyes glaze over. So that one I just don't want to hear anymore. And then abortion, whether good, bad or ugly, because abortion is one of those issues. Um, forget about the controversy. OK. Um, 
no matter what your position, whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, somewhere in the middle, uh, it really comes down to belief, okay? Um, and we don't truck in beliefs here. We truck in facts, okay? So, uh, in okay, for example, for the, um, and by the way, pro-life and pro-choice are not opposites, right? Uh, what's the opposite of pro-life? Pro-death, right? <laughs> what's the opposite of pro-choice? Uh, I guess no choice, you know? So the pro-life um, focuses on, you know, you know um, and depending, and it's hard to even write about this because depending on what you call that thing, is it a baby? Is it a zygote? Is it a, is it a fetus? Uh, will indicate what you, what, what you think. Um, and uh, the pro-choice is whether or not you believe that a woman has a right to choose uh, what goes on in her body. Now, I got my beliefs about that, and I can yell and scream all day long at you just as you can me, and neither one of us is going to change our minds. Why? Because either you believe that life begins at conception or the first trimester or the last trimester or whatever, okay, or you don't. Um, you either believe that women have the rights over their own bodies or you don't, okay? There's no there's no proof for any of that, okay? It's just arguing back and forth. The only way anybody ever changes their minds about this issue is if their personal circumstances dictate that they make a decision, okay? That's the only time people change their minds um, for, the, for this particular thing. So um, uh, that doesn't mean that this isn't something that should be argued. It's just in this class, it's not really appropriate because it, it doesn't really have to do with evidence and that's what we're really about so argue about this all you want to over drinks you know if you want to come if hey i'll give you my parents phone number they'll argue with you all day long about it okay so um uh i just want to touch base on that that's why abortion is a sticky issue because there's really no way to argue it either way okay um to, to the level that we want to argue here okay so in this particular story, that's what's going on. You got this couple sitting at a train station and um, you have to kind of figure out, you know, what it is they're talking about, this operation that they keep talking about. Now, um, <clears throat> I want you to Google white elephant. OK, and what do you think uh, when you do and you see what it what it means? You, you, I mean, it'll pop up. It'll probably reference this story, as a matter of fact. Um, what do you think it, ha it has to do with this story? All right. And. Um, and uh, they're, this is when they're having this discussion here. Uh, also, please do not read too much into the fact that they're drinking. This is 1927. The idea that you don't drink because you're pregnant is a very modern one. Okay, so maybe the fact that they're drinking beer, <laughs> maybe she normally would be drinking whiskey, and then she's and she is does know she's pregnant, so she's drinking beer. <laughs> That's the light way. I don't know. Okay, so don't read too much into the fact that she's drinking beer. Um, but the thing about this particular story th that makes it interesting is that it is that the, what makes this story interesting exists outside of the story. What do you think it means to have a man with so many hangups, okay, um, writing a story where it's another man talking to a woman about her body, okay? Now, this is 1927, but think about what that really means, okay? And um, does he... Is this? Is, can you do a feminist reading of this? You know, there's very little feminism going on in it, but maybe you can because because of what we're talking about here. These are issues. So, as when you look, if you decide to write about this story, look into it a little bit. Okay, um, it's deceptively simple, but there's a lot going on in this story. A lot going on. Um, the least of which is, let me put this in here. How come he's not just an American or the man or just he? Okay. He makes it a point to say, the American, the American. Why? Don't know. Maybe look into that, okay? So uh, anyway, uh, enjoy the story, and um, I will see you guys again soon. Have a good one, and please wash your hands.